Okay, uh, this video is saying it's, it's going to be the start of Unit 2, our Unit 2 preparation for the end of course test. Unit 2 uh, has uh, Standard 4 and Standard 5 in it. We're going to concentrate right now on Standard 4. And Standard 4 is a, looks small. Here it is here, but we want to look at close examination of the standards and we want to look at this because this is going to give us some clues about what we need to know for the end of course test for United States history. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this big part up here and I'm going to break it down. Notice it says the student will identify. We have to identify some things concerning the American Revolution. The student will identify ideological aspects of the revolution military aspects of the American Revolution and diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution. So we're going to have three different we're going to have three different videos one re, one related to ideological and then one related to the military aspects of the American Revolution and then one related to the diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution. So this stem up here we need to tie A, B, C, and D back into this this whole stem up here because this is what you need to be able to do when you take the OCT is identify ideological military and diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution this first one ideological aspects of the American Revolution is going to be the longest I'm going to have to break it down if you notice here A says explain the language organization and intellectual sources including the writings of John Locke and Montesquieu on the Declaration of Independence and the role of Thomas Jefferson that's a mouthful there and if you look, it says language. We have to break that down and look at it. Organization. We have to look at the organization declaration. These intellectual sources we're going to cover when I do the ideological aspects of the American Revolution. And then we want to look at John Locke and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And then we'll talk about Montesquieu, although I think he's better left to uh, Standard 5. But we'll look at him real quick and then we'll revisit him in Standard 5. So here's what we want to do here. Uh, this overall big thing here, the student will identify ideological, military, and, and diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution. What we want to do is focus, and I, I highlight it here for you, is the ideological aspects of the American Revolution. I underlined ideological because that's what I want to focus on in this video here. Alright, so what does ideological mean? Ideological aspects of the American Revolution. What we're talking about is ideas, okay? These beliefs and ideas that people have in their head, okay? So conscious or unconscious ideas. Whether we know we're thinking them or we don't know we're thinking them, they're ideas of right and wrong. Uh, it's, it pertains to a way of thinking about things. And in this case, what we're going to talk about is thought, this thought or ideas about as they are applied to public matters. In other words, government. Between the government and the people, what's the relationship between them? So our ideological concern here is, if we made an essential question here, is what rights did people think they have, do they have or had? What rights did the people think they had? And we're talking about people... We're talking about people during this uh, revolutionary period, and why did they think they had had them? Why did they think they had these have these certain rights? Why did they think they had them? Those rights, yeah. Why did they think they had those rights? All right, so uh, we're going to talk about why people thought they had certain rights, and then where do those rights come from in the minds of the people. So. What are the thoughts that is applied to the government? All right, so let's let's first back up and let's look at some background here. If you notice in the colonial period when we talked about the American colonies, um, a difference between Great Britain and that of Spain and France is that Great Britain kind of put the colonies on autopilot uh, and allowed them to rule themselves. So when Great Britain allowed them to rule themselves, you know, the reasons are far and wide. Probably because, you know, it's cheaper not to micromanage colonies. You know, send, uh, paying the tax collectors, paying people was one of the things that colonies paid the uh, tax collectors who were here from Great Britain. 
um, after the French and Indian War, that's going to change. But if we look here, America was in, in the habit of ruling itself. And um, Great Britain might have also been preoccupied with matters they deem more important. Or, let's say, disputes between them and Spain and France as far as all that uh, imperialism competition goes. Maybe they had all that going on at the same time. At any rate, satire neglect refers to the behavior that the colonists had toward the colonies. In other words, they neglected the colonies. They, they didn't really stand over them and pursue them aggressively. Even the Navigation Acts were not strictly enforced. So the colonists are going to develop types of government, and we saw that in New England they're going to have town meetings, and then they're going to have uh, where the people vote on those laws. We've talked about this before. And that was an example of direct democracy. And then Virginia and the southern colonies, we had a House of Burgess, or this representative form of government, this Republican government. And so the people were used to govern themselves. So the people acquired a habit of self-government. And uh, they developed a habit of self-government. Colonial leaders, the leaders of the colonies, also developed a firm sense of their rights. So a firm sense of what their rights were as far as government goes. And then they are going to demand these rights from the King of Parliament. If we read here in September 1774, when some of the rebellion was going on, the Philadelphia resolved that Congress, Congress requests the merchants and others in several colonies not to send to Great Britain any order for orders for goods. In other words, orders for goods don't buy anything from them. So we're talking about a boycott here. So in this, this is a circular that went out and it asked uh, for colonists not to buy anything to boycott all British goods don't buy it. Don't, don't send to Great Britain for any orders of goods. And to direct the execution of all orders already sent to be delayed or suspended. In other words, let's suspend or delay whatever orders we've already sent over there and bought. And let's look, here Here it is. Until, until the sense of the Congress on the means to be taken for the preservation of the liberties of America. Preservation of the liberties of America is made public. In other words, preserving the liberties of America. In other words, these liberties are rights that the people thought they had. And we see that the people thought they had rights and that those rights are going to be abused by Parliament and King George III of Great Britain. And here they're asking to boycott to preserve these rights and liberties. And we see this idea of uh, or, or a firm sense of their rights. We see that when they demand it from the King of Parliament we saw in our last uh, unit that they rebelled against these things. Okay, the French and Indian War left debt. You remember we talked about that. We're talking about how the French and Indian War led to the American Revolution. And then Great Britain passes a lot of taxes, new taxes to repay the debt. Well, Americans felt that you could not tax them until they were represented in the legislature. So that was one of the rights they felt they had was that you could not tax the colonists unless they gave you consent to tax them. And that's an idea of government by the consent of the people. So that's a right that we know they felt they had because after the Stamp, tax, stamp Act, they said no taxation without representation. They voiced that loud and clear. So they felt they had this right to government by the consent of the people and if the if the, gov if the people did not give their consent for the government to tax them, then the government could not tax them. And then we see their protest, rebellion, and their boycotting of all those goods. We saw the Boston Tea Party, even the Boston Massacre take place. And then we saw that things are going to escalate between Great Britain and the colonies with intolerable acts. And they suspend colonial government. That's going to be really tough on Americans the, you know the town hall, the town meetings that were suspended in New England. Uh, it's going to be a slap in the face for Americans who believe that they have a right to self-government because they had a habit of it that had been formed over the years. And then the colonists are going to get together 
and formed committees of correspondence, Sons and Daughters of Liberty, to resist what they feel is Great Britain's abuse against their rights. And in the First Continental Congress, we discussed the Olive Branch petition that they sent to the king, saying that they had certain rights, and that he was abusing those rights, and the king, George III, pretty much just, just ignored them. But in, in any event, they send it over there for a redress of grievance saying these are our rights, you're you're taking our rights away from us. Alright, then in the Second Continental Congress, by this time things had escalated. There was a battle of Lexington and Concord. And then in the Second Continental Congress they do two things. They they select George Washington as commander in chief of the Continental Army, and then they they ask Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. And here Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence is, is what we're going to, end result, that's what we're going to do in A and 4A. We're going to talk about who influenced Thomas Jefferson's thinking. What ideological things affected his thinking and his, and, and his writing of the Declaration of Independence. That's what we'll eventually get to. So let me just make a bold statement. The Enlightenment period and the Great Awakening we discussed in Unit 1 are going to influence uh, it's going to influence American independence. Our way of thinking, in other words. Our ideology about government, what we feel is right and wrong, uh, is going to be affected, this ideological view of what government, our ideas applied to government, is going to be affected by the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening. And let me take a quote from John Adams here kind of explain what I'm talking about here. John Adams says the revolution, that's the American Revolution, because that's what unit, uh, that's what uh, Standard 4 is all about, the American Revolution. Okay, so let's go back and look at that. It said the student will identify the ideological, military, and diplomatic aspects of the American Revolution. Here it is right here. So that's what Standard 4 is all about. And what we're talking about now is the ideological background for aspects of it. The revolution was affected before the war commenced. In other words, uh, John Adams says when we talk about the American Revolution, we're not talking about the war that took place on the battlefield. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. Let's look at that. In the minds and the hearts of the people. In their minds. We're talking here about ideas. We're talking about ideology. Our understanding of our way of thinking about government and what is right and wrong consciously or unconsciously and he's saying that the revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people and it says a change in the religious sentiments of their duties and obligation a change in the religious sentiments of their duties and obligations and what, what he's hinting here too I think is the great awakening and we talked about this in in the first uh, in the unit one near the end. And the Great Awakening we said was a period of traumatic religious revival. It's this huge religious revival or revivalism in the American colonies. And we said that rebellion and taking over self control of our own religion was very important in this. Uh, so we see. Uh, rebellion against authoritarian religious rule, rebellious spirit spilling over to other areas like social and political spheres. Here we're going to talk about the political spheres and how how the Great Awakening spilled over in that. And we did that some. We said that there was a spirit of rebellion along political lines. And we, we talked about this word popular sovereignty that the people can govern themselves. It hasn't been coined yet, but the idea was there. And we see this going to impact uh, the ideas that are in the Declaration of Independence. So, from a religious standpoint, during the Great Awakening, was that there was a there was this covenant, uh, there was a chain of command. Uh, God was uh, to ruler. This is God to ruler of the people. These changes in order between God and the people are going to change as we go forward, and we're going to look at that in one second. So, people asserted their self-control over their religion in the Great Awakening. This religious revival, you know, took this stagnant, boring control of people's uh, religion and faith 
and their idea of redemption from the church and turned it over to the people and they asserted self-control over it. They took a more personal stance and got involved in their own religion. And this is going to influence politics by driving colonists to question the authority of government, just like they did the authority of the church. So there's a growth in the idea and the notion that a state, state, that of state rule is a contract with the people, and there's going to be a contract between the people and their government. So let's look at this. We talked about covenants, and then the church, the covenants between the church and the believer was that the believers, believer owed the church allegiance but that the church also owed this duty to be faithful to the gospel or the word of God and people had a right to sever ties with the church if the covenant was broken and a lot of these people you know a lot of these new lights we talked about uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield felt that the Church of England had corrupted the church and that people were not following the gospel the word of God and so they had a duty to 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 do away with the church and try some other way and this is going to carry over into government and people the idea that people owe allegiance to the government but that the government owed the protection of people's rights owed people the protection of the rights people had a right to sever the ties with the church if the if that covenant was broken in government and we're going to talk about the social contract and where those ideas come from okay all right, so what we had during the, the Great Awakening was this religious zeal or a lot of emotionally charged excitement. Uh, it's going to turn to uh, revolution and sentiments of self-government. That's what we talked about. And we gave a quote, every man being thus allowed to be his own pope, to be his own pope, in other words, take control of his religion, he becomes disposed to wish to become his own king. In other words, self-government. So William Knox hit on something there. And if we look at John Adams quote again, he said the revolution was effected before the war commenced. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. A change in their religious sentiments of their duties and obligations. He touches here on these religious sentiments. Okay. And uh, the Enlightenment. Let's turn to the Enlightenment, how it impacted people and their ideas about government. In 18th century, this philosophy, the Enlightenment philosophy, stressing that reason could be used to improve the human condition. And we're about to talk about some arguments between two people that talk about reason and that talk about human nature. Okay, And in the age of reason, it's going to introduce new ideas. There's going to be a change in thinking. This change in thinking uh, between how government and the people relate. Why do we have government? And so we're going to change to that people can govern themselves, that they're born with natural rights. And we're going to talk about John Locke. And he's a, he's a person from the Enlightenment. You know, and then we're going to talk about he influences Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and their ideas. And Thomas Jefferson is going to be the one that writes our Declaration of Independence. So that's what we need to get to. Is this Enlightenment period says it stressed that human reason could be used to improve the human condition. And we also call the Enlightenment period the age of reason. All right, so the Enlightenment period is going to be from 1650 to 1800, long period of time. And within this period of time, we're going to have the first Great Awakening here. And some of these people we're going to talk about, here's Thomas Hobbes. He's not in our standards. But I use them as a comparison to contrast the ideas of John Law. Okay? So we want to look at their different opinions. What changed? In other words, what changed? Because John Adams says there was a change in the thinking. And we're going to look at what was the change from Thomas Hobbes to John Law. What's the difference? And then we're going to talk about Thomas Jefferson who wrote our Declaration of Independence. And he gets his ideas from this guy, John Law. We're going to talk about how. We're going to look at similarities. And then later on, we'll briefly mention Montesquieu, and then we'll come back to him later in Standard 5. All right, so let's look at Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and see why their ideas were different and what the change that occurred between Hobbes and Locke was. And Jefferson is going to be tuned in to John Locke, so let's look. All right, so this guy here, Thomas Hobbes, comes up with this thing we call Hobbesian philosophy. And John Locke is going to contradict this guy and disagree with him. His is called Lockean philosophy. Let's look at Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes wrote a book called Leviathan, 
And the Leviathan, in biblical terms, is a biblical creature that devours people uh, for sin. It creates this fear in people. And his idea of human nature was that people were naturally selfish. That people are born into a solitary world that is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, what does this mean? You know, it means that given a chance in the natural state of man, he will rob, kill, steal, and do whatever he can to take someone's property or whatever he wants. So since that is the nature of man, we need a Leviathan that's going to put fear in man to keep him from doing this. In order to promote order, we need something to strike fear into man. So Thomas Hobbes says what we need is a monarchy. In other words, we need a king. We need this person that rules over us, and then the people need to give up their rights. He believed they did have rights, uh, but that they need to give those up to the king or the monarch in order to live in order with one another, to live in harmony with one another. And this is a social contract here. Social contract being is we're this nasty, brutish, poor, just ugly people. We're born sinners. That's what we are, and we'll do these things to one another if we left in our natural state of sin. So he says we need a monarchy, and this is called social contract. We need a monarchy because the monarchy is going to protect us from one another and create this order in which we live in. Okay, That was his political philosophy we call Hobbesian philosophy. John Locke was different. He, he wrote uh, actually two things, but one of the important things concerning government is his uh, work called the two treatises of government another one's an essay on human understanding where he talks about human beings in their natural state um, he believed that human beings were born with a tabula rasa and that's Latin for a blank slate in other words we're born innocent uh, and our human nature is characterized by our ability to reason and have tolerance to one another so his is a little bit more optimistic he believes in the age of reason. He's a, he's a fabric of the Enlightenment. That reason and the intolerance were, were characteristics of the Enlightenment uh, shows that John Locke's beliefs were tuned into the Enlightenment period. He believed that God gave us natural rights, people, and that people had the reason, could use reason, to rule over themselves, that they could tolerate one another, they could make laws for one another, and that the people themselves could rule themselves, in other words, popular sovereignty. And he opposed the monarchy. He argued instead that uh, for a government by the consent of the people. In other words, that the people can govern over themselves, and nothing can be done unless the people consented to it. So that, in essence, is the difference between Hobbesian philosophy and Lockean philosophy. And this is what Thomas Jefferson is going to be influenced by. And we're going to see some of this in his writing, the Declaration of Independence. So if we look at John Adams' quote again down here at the bottom, we're going to emphasize down here, but let's read it again. The revolution was effected before the war commenced. The revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. A change in the religious sentiments of their duties and obligations. This radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people was the real American Revolution. Radical change in these principles, opinions, or ideas, and sentiments, how we felt about government, is going to be the real revolution. So what he's talking about here is, is, is this ideological ideological and conscious thing about right and wrong and the relationship about government and public matters between the people and the government. In other words, what we're looking at here is the ideological aspects of the American Revolution. That's what we're doing. We're identifying the ideological aspects of the revolution. And John Adams drives this home. You know, he says uh, that there was a change in religious sentiments, and then he said there was a radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people, and that was the real and in other words, change in the people's minds and, and their principles and opinions and how they believed is going to be the biggest change. And we're going to see this and we talked about it in the last the last part of Unit One, Thomas Paine. Uh, and Thomas Paine's ideas are going to be influenced by these Enlightenment thinkers. He's going to be an Enlightenment thinker. 
and he's going to write a, a pamphlet called Common Sense. We talked about that, and it's going to promote American independence. And we said that he's going to convince people to declare independence. And one of his primary arguments is that uh, he opposed the monarchy. He said that King George III was a pharaoh. He said he started wars and uh, abused people's rights. And uh, he's going to favor a Republican form of government. And if we look at a Republican form of government, and that's a government without a king. And Republican principles are very important. And they're going to tie into what John Locke believes. And uh, Paine is even going to use biblical analogies to reference and illustrate some of these arguments. And that, that indicates that he was affected by this great awakening. Okay, So what is Republicanism? What is it? And it's the belief that government should be based on the consent on the consent of the government. Look at that. Government should be based on the consent of the government. And that's one of John Locke's fundamental principles. He argued that the government should be by the consent of the people. And here is Thomas Paine arguing this same thing. That we should have a Republican government and that it should be based on the consent of the government. It was a, Republicanism is the belief that Republican values... Uh, and those Republican values are, were inspired by American revolutionaries who defy the Stamp Act. And uh, you, we see that when they said no taxation without representation. In other words, people needed to be represented. People needed to give their consent to be taxed. So we look at this visual here. What is a republic or republicanism? What is a republican form of government or a republic? There were no kings, and the head of the state was usually a president or some leader, and the head of state was elected by the people, elected by the people, and that those people had a term of office. Okay. All right, so Thomas Paine believed that government should be responsible to the will of the people. Okay. And let's look at a compar comparison here of a monarchy and a republic. A monarchy is ruled by a king. But a republic is only only the representatives who are elected by the people can rule. Only representatives who are elected by the people can rule. And then the king was given uh, given power to rule by God over here under absolute uh, rights of the king. That was a theory for a while. Then parliament comes into play. But that's a t totally different discussion. Over here under republic, rulers uh, governed by the consent of the people. And then the people gave the rulers the right to govern over them and that God gave the people the rights but the people would give the rulers uh, the right to govern over them consent social contract that they had between themselves all right so here over here monarchy the king and parliament were not limited in their powers but under republic a republican form of government the government was limited and the government was responsible to the people and their will under a monarchy, the king determined through, was determined through hereditary means. In other words, the next king would be King George III's son, uh, through hereditary, through a bloodline. But in a republic, rulers are going to be determined through people's vote in an election. In other words, the people are going to vote for them. So that's the difference between a republic and a monarchy. Okay. So what we have in 4A is a big, huge area, but we're going to kind of concentrate this down into this ideological aspect of the American Revolution. And let me turn back to that for a second, this ideological, ideological aspects of the American Revolution is going to tie into, you know, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, the intellectual sources of the Declaration of Independence. So we're going to, overall, we're going to explain the language, organization, and uh, intellectual sources, Declaration of Independence. But we're going to use language and organization in the next video. We're going to cover that. We're going to talk about the Declaration of Independence next. But right now, we want to talk about the intellectual sources. John Locke, he says, uh, uh, Declaration of Independence, including the writings of John Locke and the role of Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson is going to be the author of the Declaration of Independence. He's going to write it. And he uh, heavily, heavily influenced by John Locke. And we just spoke about John Locke. Here's John Locke here. 
and his ideas here in two treatises of government. He is going to influence Thomas Jefferson. So, uh, the social contract theory in particular. Okay. All right. So the Declaration of Independence was mainly written by Thomas Jefferson. It was written in 1776. It declared American independence from England. It did not create a new government. It just basically uh, declared that America was independent and separate from Great Britain or England. And his main ideas in his writing, the Declaration of Independence, are taken from John Locke's uh, social contract theory, or John Locke's uh, two treatises on government. Uh, both talked about natural rights. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is going to call them not natural rights, he's going to call them inalienable rights. But John Locke refers to natural rights are God given, our Creator gave us rights. And uh, in the Declaration of Independence, here's some of the language. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, God gave us these rights, not the king, not parliament, God. So these natural rights uh, come from John Locke and his two treatises on government, but they influence Thomas Jefferson, and this is Thomas Jefferson's writing in the Declaration of Independence here. Okay. All right, so uh, if we look at the differences in natural rights, John Locke concentrated on property a lot. He thought that property or the work of people and the, and the product of their work was a right under government. So life, liberty, and property. These are things government cannot take from us without due process of law. All right, and then Thomas Jefferson says life and liberty. He agrees with those two, but he says the pursuit of happiness. And one of the reasons he disagrees with slavery, even though he's a, he's a riddle, he's going to have slaves, he disagrees with slavery in the form of property. So he's going to say the pursuit of happiness. In other words, we could say liberty, political liberty, or the liberty to carry out a profession we choose to. So, John Locke's social contract theory is a theory that influenced Thomas Jefferson's writing in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it said the sole purpose of government was the protection of life, liberty, and property. That's government's job. That's government's duty is to protect those natural rights. So, we see a theme here in ideals and beliefs in the social contract and natural rights, ideas and beliefs. That's the theme we're talking about is ideas or ideology. So, John Locke believed that if a government failed to protect its citizens' rights, life, liberty, and property, and instead oppressed those things or violated those rights, then the citizens had a right to overthrow the government and create a new government. And so, Thomas Jefferson's going to believe the same thing. We'll see in the language. When we go over the language, Thomas Jefferson's going to put some of this language in there. So, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, John Hancock, Edward Rutledge, all those guys are very instrumental in the Declaration of Independence, but Thomas Jefferson is the writer. Okay. So, I believe at this juncture we have talked about the ideological aspects of the American Revolution. Okay. And then the next one we're going to talk about the Declaration of Independence a little more in depth. In depth. I hope this helps.